Hello, I'm Giselle Hale, the mayor of Redwood City. On behalf of the City Council, I want to welcome you to the 2022 State of the City Address, and I want to thank you for the privilege of serving as your mayor this year. The tone, information, and topics will be very different this year. Rather than covering a broad set of topics, we're going to focus on the community's top priority, housing and homelessness. And we're going to go deep into these topics with the goal of helping residents better understand how we got here, what we're doing about it, and what you can do to help. In this presentation, you'll hear me cite historical facts and present day realities about housing and homelessness that may be uncomfortable to hear and absorb. Today's Redwood City is an amazing, diverse community of over 80,000 residents. And this is not about assigning blame, pointing fingers, or casting shame. But after the past two years of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, and what we have seen related to these issues, we can no longer dance around the edges of our housing and homelessness crisis in Redwood City. So I ask you to join me in understanding the facts and coming together as a community united to work towards a future where every one of our neighbors has a safe, affordable place to call home. Since becoming mayor, one of the most common questions I've received goes something like this. Why are there so many homeless encampments? It's unsightly. Doesn't anyone care about these people or keeping our city clean? Well, the short answer is yes, we do care very much. Housing and homelessness have been the city's top priorities for many years. However, the real answer is long. It takes some self-reflection about our past decisions as a region. Homelessness is a result of years of underinvesting in new housing, leading to rising housing costs, both of which have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the lack of human services. When people need to help finding stability and basic needs like food and shelter, counseling, substance abuse treatment, or other services to promote self-sufficiency, dignity, and happiness in their lives, they absolutely should have access to it. You know, there's a popular Chinese proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. While we can't undo the past actions and decisions that led us to today, we can find solutions for the future. And the best time to act is right now. When it comes to the housing crisis, we have to act with urgency. The good news is we have invested significantly to address these issues. We've already seen some great success, but the reality is we cannot do this alone. These issues must be addressed in collaboration with other levels of government. Before we can talk about where we are going, we need to understand how we got here. Our city council has embraced equity as a foundational principle in our policies and services. And we're taking a fresh look at how past inequities have contributed to today's challenges. San Mateo County, like much of the nation, has a long and troubled history at the root of our housing crisis. Many of us know that housing has not been readily available to all in our society. There is a wealth of information on the internet about our nation's history of redlining, housing maps to favor white residents and marginalize people of color. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend looking up the sobering topic of redlining. Local records confirm that redlining and restrictive covenants were alive and well here on the peninsula not too long ago. By the 1960s and 70s, these unjust practices had largely defined who lived where. Redlining has been documented from San Carlos to East Palo Alto, and restrictive covenants prohibiting people of color from living in certain neighborhoods can still be found in the deeds of Redwood City Homes. It's a lot of history for us to try to unwind now, but the story doesn't stop there. In recent decades, including today, gentrification has exacerbated these inequities. Here we are today in Redwood City. This map depicts areas with low to medium segregation in gray and high segregation in dark red. And as you can see, Redwood City is dark red. 
but this die wasn't entirely cast by 1970. In the 1980s, there was still a moderate amount of segregation in Redwood City and throughout the peninsula, as indicated by the light gray shading. But by 1990, Redwood City had become more segregated than the prior decade. You can see it switched from light gray to dark red here in 1990. By 2000, a few neighboring cities followed suit, and by 2010, a few more, until we find ourselves today at the center of the most highly segregated areas in the region. In fact, we are the fifth most segregated city in the nine-county Bay Area. And these racial inequities reflect economic inequities in our community. The effects of this are profound. Overall, it has been found that highly segregated Black Latinx neighborhoods correlate with negative life outcomes for many people in those communities, including rates of poverty, income, educational attainment, home values, and health outcomes. And now, formerly redlined neighborhoods are disproportionately impacted by gentrification and displacement. This is a crucial piece to the story because home ownership is the key to building family wealth over time. This gap in home ownership has led to a gap in wealth that is staggering. In San Mateo and Santa Clara counties, nearly half of the region's children live in households that do not make enough money for their own basic necessities. The largest component of these costs aside from taxes, is the cost of childcare. We know that limited English-speaking households struggle the most. In fact, nine out of 10 are relying on some form of public or private assistance for the most basic needs. In 2021, it was impossible for anyone earning minimum wage to be above the self-sufficiency standard in Silicon Valley, even if they were a dual income family with no children. To compound the problem, San Mateo County job growth has far outpaced housing permits over the past decades. The majority of San Mateo County's land is preserved for open space and agriculture. And of the available developed land, more than two thirds of the current housing stock is single family homes. The Bay Area has underbuilt housing for extremely low income households by more than 37,000 units over the last 10 years. Now I want you to think back to March of 2020. You know, many of us sheltered in place, working from the comfort of our homes, and yet our extremely low income residents, those who are personal care aides, cashiers, janitors, housekeepers, cooks, child care providers, they were out of work or they were going to work with the very real risk of catching COVID-19 and bringing it home to their families. The most vulnerable members of our community were dramatically impacted by the pandemic. And Redwood City responded with a raft of new programs and emergency services. The City Council acted quickly to prevent evictions of residents and to establish a COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program. We provided financial relief to our small businesses and to childcare providers. We required grocery stores and pharmacies to pay an additional $5 per hour of hazard pay during the pandemic. And our Fair Oaks Community Center coordinated food distribution, transportation assistance, emergency rental and utilities application support, and offered shower and laundry services to those in need. I would like to ask our homeless and Human Services Manager Terry Chin to now share more about the Fair Oaks Community Center services and how our Emergency Rental Assistance Program helped keep Redwood City residents in Redwood City. Hi, I'm Terry. Um, I oversee the Fair Oaks Community Center, which is a community center of our city where we are there to serve our community. We provide food resources. We help people who have found themselves 
on the verge of homelessness or have actually become homeless, whether that be families or individuals, we connect them to our countywide system to help people have alternatives for emergency housing and long-term going back to housing. We also do homelessness prevention. We actually help people with financial assistance for rent use assistance, utility assistance. We have food programs, subsidized childcare program. We have programs for older adults in our community. And we are really here to serve. We are proud to be that piece of what we do as the city. So if anyone in our community is needing assistance, whether that's helping to pay their rent, they need food, they have just had a situation they've never been in and don't know what to do, that's what we're here for as the Ferrells Community Center. The best thing is to just give us a call at our main line and we will be able to direct you as to how we can best assist you. We do provide food assistance, we do have a diaper program, so we do have things that people can also come and be able to get from us, but the best first step is to give us a call. Despite our best efforts to meet these needs, we know that systemic failures in the housing and labor markets increase the risk of homelessness. We also know that more than any other time, there is a lack of housing for our low-income neighbors. Without housing options, people face eviction, instability, and homelessness. Low-income households often do not earn enough to pay for food, clothing, transportation, and a place they can call home. And we know that most minority groups experience homelessness at higher rates largely due to longstanding historical and structural racism. I also want to share other reasons people may be experiencing homelessness. During the 2019 One Day Homeless Count for San Mateo County, all people experiencing homelessness who were surveyed were asked whether they had ongoing health conditions, physical disabilities, used drugs or alcohol, had psychiatric or emotional conditions, or had traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress order, PTSD. If they responded in the affirmative, a follow-up question asked whether the situation kept them from living in stable housing or holding a job. The highest rate of reported severe mental illness was for those in emergency shelters. Alcohol and or drug use was also highest among people in emergency shelters. Unsheltered adults, mostly women and single mothers, reported fleeing from domestic violence at a higher rate than sheltered adults. I would like to introduce you to Danny and Jen. After being evicted and losing their car, they were living on the streets full time while struggling with substance abuse issues. Through the help of Life Moves, one of the city's nonprofit partners, they now call Redwood City Home. Let's take a look at this short video to hear their story. Hello, um, I'm Danny Hayes. And I'm Jennifer Goins. And we're going to do a, a short video on uh, what, hap what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. So. In August of 2019, um, Jennifer and I, um, <laughs> Jennifer and I were, we, we got evicted from our house in San Jose. We lost our car that month as well. So yeah. now we're on the streets. We came with, full, yeah. we were full time <clears throat> homeless on the streets. With substance abuse issues. And my daughter, my nine year old daughter at the time was with my niece for the summer. Well, summer ended and she had to go back to <clears throat> her kids had to go back to school and she had to move back in with her dad and she said well I'm gonna drop Audrey off to you and I was like what am I gonna do so I called 211 from Garadon train station from Garadon train station we had like eight dollars in our pocket I think yeah and uh <clears throat> they hooked me up with the veterans crisis line uh because I'm a veteran and um so Moving forward, um, we called. Yeah, we called on a Monday and we um, found out about the Haven House probably by Wednesday or Thursday and we checked in on Friday. We had a shower, we had a bathroom right there. Um, those were issues that we had when we were living on the streets. We had Kate, I had Craig as a case manager um, and then I, I had to switch that over to Evelyn both of them were uh, a huge part in um, our success and where we're at to where we're at now there was therapy there was monday night and wednesday night group uh sessions at haven house where everybody met 
this is pre COVID. Classes yeah, is on nutrition, <clears throat> classes on all, all kinds of, of good stuff. Yeah. Going back to college, uh, you name it. It's priceless um, what it did for my life. It allowed me to um, slowly find employment, um, yeah. go back to college. Both, I started going back to school. college. Um, and to graduate my drug treatment program, get my children back with visitations. Yeah, I have full custody of Audrey now, and um, we're housed in Redwood City. We live in a three bedroom, two bath duplex um, off of Woodside Road. Doors are still opening, and we're um, taking advantage of every opportunity that we can, and that we're very grateful for your support and everything that you, know, uh, that you guys you. did for us. Danny and Jen's story is one that illustrates the vulnerability and the resilience of our unhoused community members. It also, also shows that when dealing with complex long-term challenges like housing and homelessness, cities cannot do it alone. We rely heavily on partnerships with the county and state, community organizations, and community members. This is exactly what we did with the city's safe parking program. We are balancing community health and safety needs with meaningful support to help people move out of homelessness. You know, just a few years ago, the city heard from many community members about the rise of people living in RVs on city streets. The city council worked to establish a safe parking ad hoc committee, and Vice Mayor Diana Reddy and myself worked closely with the community members and partners to create a successful solution. Early on, we determined the importance of conducting community meetings to understand the impact of RV residents living in locations not intended for that purpose. From the neighborhood residents and the businesses, we learned that most people agreed that RV residents should have a safe place to park. There was also an ongoing concern about environmental health and safety related issues such as garbage, human waste, improper dumping of black water down storm drains, traffic safety, theft, and more. When we met with RV residents, we learned most lived in Redwood City prior to moving to the RV motor home that they currently lived in. Most were housed previously. They had rented an apartment or even a room, but they could no longer afford to live here. And most were adults, but there were also families with children. Most were working, construction workers, auto mechanics, college graduates, sales representatives. Some were on fixed incomes. While some lived in their motor home during the week and then they returned to a home elsewhere on the weekends, the vast majority were living in their RV motor home every night, many for over a year. Most hoped living in their RV was a temporary situation and they wanted to return to a stable housing situation. To address the issue, we limited RV parking on city streets for anyone not participating in the safe parking program. This allowed us to immediately limit impacts on neighborhoods and businesses. At the time of implementation, most cities only offered 12 hour parking and we recognized this didn't solve problems for anyone. So we worked with assembly member Phil Tang to pass AB 2553, state legislation that made it possible to open safe parking programs on a 24 by seven basis. We funded a nonprofit partner, Life Moves, to operate on site and we did street permitted parking for 120 approved participants. Today, over 50% of the households in the safe parking program have been matched with some form of housing subsidy and they are on a path towards permanent housing. I wanna introduce you to David Trupiano, one such individual who was able to transition from our safe parking program into Shores Landing, one of the three hotels the county recently converted to affordable housing with state funds. Okay, hello, my name is David Trupiano. Uh, I, was, I was living in La Honda, California, actually not in La Honda, about 20, 20 miles away out, out in the Santa Cruz Mountains in a private community called uh, Patola Park Heights, uh, which was gated. And I was responsible for the gate and for fire protection and, ra and also radio communications. Uh, I, when my wife died, I unfortunately 10 days later had a, a major stroke which didn't last that long. I was in Stanford only for only a week and a half and came back out and we was able to use up all the money I had to throw a celebration party for her and then ended up with another stroke back in the hospital. And when I came out, my landlord told me that, he, that I was evicted. I worked very late 
for three nights straight to past midnight. And uh, I had the motor home down in East Palo Alto at that point. I, I then uh, uh, was tr you know, trying to pack the place up and took off at 12.30 one night to go back, th back down the hill because he wouldn't even let me sleep there. And uh, the, re the result was I was in the fog and drove off the cliff, wrecked my truck, broke my neck, and had a major concussion. And it was in the hospital from then, then on for the next uh, f about four months. Uh, when I came out, I still owned the motorhome, fortunately. So I had a place to go in, at least, but no, no money left and, no, and nothing else. Uh, through a friend in the neighborhood of, uh, of Ma Maple Street Life Moves operation, he had pointed out this place had just opened up, the Life Moves, and I went down and signed up as fast as I could, you know, and it, it turned out to be a very advantageous situation for me. I had a place to go that was safe, and, you know, I wasn't worried about somebody knocking on the door at any time, and it, it uh, I can say it was advantageous. Well, since, I, since I'm handicapped, uh, you know, I came out in pretty bad shape. Uh, it was a, uh, be behooved to everybody for, for me to go to a more secure place than, than, than being in the motor home. And uh, they, they were very accommodating in that they were able to get this location for me here at Shores Landing and uh, get it subsidized to the point where I could afford it. So I'm here now and looking forward to the next year taking care of medical problems and uh, continuing on with life as best I can. We have now turned our efforts to encampments. We can't just use the same playbook as the safe parking program because encampments involve a different set of challenges. Some of these include legal limitations on what the city can do, the fact that we can't force someone to accept services or shelter, and perhaps most notably, the majority of encampments in Redwood City are not on city land, which limits our ability to respond as quickly as we would like. We know collaboration across all levels of government and with the community will still be key. And we are using the same creativity and collaboration to care for our residents experiencing homelessness and living in encampments. While the county government is responsible for human services, emergency housing, and the shelter system, the city government is an active partner in the county's efforts to achieve functional zero, meaning that anyone who desires shelter can have it. We also support the county's efforts to increase emergency housing in Redwood City and to ensure Redwood City residents are given priority. This includes an innovative new emphasis on individual living spaces, which we think will help remove barriers people have to accepting help. This will provide people with a stabilized living situation so we can support other needs they may have, such as mental and physical health care and employment assistance. We have prioritized emergency housing in San Mateo County and we are making progress by converting hotels to shelters and permanent affordable housing. Redwood City has also exchanged properties so the county can build a 240 bed state-of-the-art shelter known as a navigation center to serve our community. The navigation center model provides individual short-term housing which also offering a range of intensive safety net services on site. To equalize the value of the two exchange properties, five shelter hold units will be available to immediately provide emergency housing for residents experiencing homelessness in Redwood City. We are also working hard to build relationships with those experiencing homelessness, contacting residents in encampments regularly to offer shelter and services. As I mentioned, we can't force people to accept services and we know that sometimes people need to be offered services many times and in a variety of ways before they feel comfortable enough to accept them. We will soon be able to do even more of this work. I'm excited to share that Redwood City was recently awarded $1.8 million in state funding, allowing us to bolster our efforts to transition individuals from living in encampments to permanent housing while also addressing the long-term impact of the encampments in the community. The city is fortunate to have a licensed mental health clinician, Patricia Baker, working with our police department through a new pilot program. 
Patricia is going to share more about how this program is part of the reimagining how we respond to 911 calls of mental health crisis with a more robust crisis continuum of care. Hi, I'm Patricia Baker. I'm the new Community Wellness and Crisis Response Team Mental Health Clinician, and I'm very excited to be part of the Community Wellness and Crisis Response Team. Through this pilot program, we are changing how the Redwood City Police Department responds to calls from people who may be experiencing a mental health crisis. So as a mental health clinician, I'm able to show up differently than a uniformed police officer. For instance, we may receive a call about someone with symptoms of severe depression or anxiety or experiencing symptoms of mania and acting erratically. And sometimes that person just really needs to talk and they're receptive to being encouraged to reflect on their current needs. That's what we do, we talk. So when responding to such calls, I can also provide linkage to San Mateo County resources and referrals. So this includes providing options to victims of domestic violence, individuals experiencing contentious custody battles, other emergency services, and if appropriate, and if indicated, hospitalization or rehabilitation programs and referrals. I've also been teaming up with the city partners like Life Moves to visit homeless encampments and work collaboratively to provide housing and social services referrals to unhoused residents who need them. I'm very proud to be part of the team to provide appropriate intervention, response options and resources, which I think are critical. Our hope is that individuals receive the help they need and that the mental health and well-being of the individual is addressed and that our interaction is one that is positive. We have also partnered with the Downtown Streets team, which builds teams that restore dignity, inspire hope, and provide a pathway to recover from homelessness. Maddie Shearer, the Redwood City Downtown Streets Team Project Manager, is going to share more about this program and how it empowers team members to take an active role in their own recovery and at the same time is helping to change perceptions about homelessness in our community. Hi everybody, my name is Maddie Shire and I'm the Senior Project Manager for Downtown Streets Team here in Redwood City. Uh, Downtown Streets team is a group of volunteers, uh, people who are currently unhoused in Redwood City or who have formerly experienced homelessness here. Um, we all come together every single day of the week to clean up our beautiful city in Redwood City. As people volunteer with us, we provide them with case management, employment services, uh, connection to jobs, housing, um, but most importantly, we create a team and we create a family of peers. Um, what we do in our community is we support people experiencing homelessness, we support local businesses, we support the local community, um, and most importantly I think is we support each other. Uh, this group of people comes together and we go out, we clean, um, but most importantly we are changing the perception of what homelessness is and what life is uh, while you're experiencing homelessness as well. Um, a lot of people really struggle with having a future in their mind, a reachable future. And so what we do is say, this is accomplishable. And these are the steps that it takes to get there. Also, this is a whole group of people who are going through the exact same thing. And these are also people who have achieved what you're hoping to achieve as well. Um, so our staff works hand in hand with those team members um, to provide the case management, employment services, and whatever else people need. Uh, this program is, is a, a, very, a very good program for me because I'm in mental illness and this program support me a lot to keep busy and doing something very good for the city. Hi, uh, my name is Cynthia and I used to be homeless. I know how it feels to be homeless, but when I came here I already had housing and I was in the middle of uh, a depression, post-traumatic stress relapse. And uh, I started coming here, um, then I left, and then when I was strong enough, I came back. So Downtown Streets Team was a miracle for me. It got me up and uh, it helped me get up in the morning to have something to go to. And now I'm a green shirt, and I lead the team. And uh, my uh, depression and um, anxiety has dissipated, and I'm happy again. 
I, I get up every morning and I'm excited to come here. What we've learned from our partner All Home is that the best day to house someone who is experiencing homelessness is their first day on the streets. After that, the probability of them becoming housed goes down with each day. So preventing homelessness is a key strategy to contain the situation. We know that low-income housing availability and anti-displacement strategies are the biggest contributors to homeless prevention. And that's why in Redwood City, we're diligently working towards meeting our unique community housing needs for people at all income levels. Beyond enabling immediate economic stability, we're focused on long-term housing solutions. This includes supporting affordable housing production through the use of city property, implementation of the affordable housing ordinance, and allocation of city housing funds. We're working to increase the production of affordable housing units. There are 1,200 affordable units across 22 projects that are either under construction, approved, or proposed. Of those, 50% are low income, 31% are very low income, and 8% are extremely low income. Looking ahead, we need to plan for homes for all in our community. A state required process to adopt a housing element means we must identify where 4,500 new units can be built between 2023 and 2031. To create the housing element, we will project housing needs for all income levels, build strategies for preserving and improving existing housing, and update city regulations, policies, or standards that might limit the improvement and development of housing. In addition, we know that current economic pressures could easily lead to displacement of residents. The city has taken a leadership role in being thoughtful about how its policies and funding priorities can reduce displacement of Redwood City residents in both the short and long term. In the last two years, we have worked with a very diverse group of stakeholders to create an anti-displacement strategy to prevent displacement, preserve affordable housing, and protect housing options for the city's low and moderate income residents. All of this leads to you, how you can help. Collaboration is key, and just as it will take all levels of government to solve the housing crisis, we also need community support and engagement. There are many opportunities to lend your voice as we explore short and long-term solutions to ending homelessness. In the last few years, we've invested an unprecedented $4.8 million on homeless initiatives, and we will consider additional funding recommendations with the upcoming city budget this June. We invite you to share your thoughts on the budget. We have also sought community feedback on the $1 million participatory budgeting pilot program, the People's Budget. We are currently seeking community input on where housing should go through the housing element, and you can be part of that discussion as well. In June, we also expect to formally adopt the city's anti-displacement strategy to avoid displacement in Redwood City, including tenant protections and mobile home park preservation. We hope you can join that conversation. So as you can see, we are working on many fronts to increase the amount of affordable housing in our community and to help our residents experiencing homelessness transition into safe and supportive residences with dignity. It's a complex set of problems with a long and difficult history, and the pandemic has added to the challenges, but we are up to the task. Redwood City is partnering with the county, state, and nonprofit partners on multiple fronts and doing everything we can in our own backyard. And we're beginning to see change. And we welcome your participation as we continue this important work together.